It's a great song, but I don't know it. everybody here we go it is that time again matt connerton unleashed and we are live from the studios of wmnh 95.3 fm in glorious downtown manchester new hampshire also on comcast 97 if you're in manchester and hello to all of our online listeners across the nation and around the globe you can go to my website mattconnerton.com for all of your live streaming options social media links contact info show archives etc etc today is tuesday may 16 2023 uh we have an exciting uh show for you today uh coming up in uh, just a few minutes uh hopefully it works out uh the, the last time we had an international guest there was a little bit of a technical uh kerfuffle uh but it did get figured out uh using skype <laughs> so we hope for the best but uh we have another european uh who's going to be skyping in uh our new friend uh yuri from the band oberdon or i'm sorry oberon i keep wanting to put a d in there that's not there it's oberon uh, he's going to be Skyping in at 4.15 uh, from Italy, and uh, we'll talk with him for a bit. Really like his music. We played a couple of his songs yesterday. In fact, uh, yesterday I opened the show with a song called Time to Sleep Part 1, and uh, the one that you just heard was Time to Sleep Part 2. I figured uh, that would be an appropriate opener for today, and uh, we'll play something else of his later as well. So uh, he's going to be joining us uh, again uh, uh Good Lord willing and the creeks don't rise. That's an expression I've heard. <laughs> so that'll be uh, coming up at 4.15. And then uh, in the second hour today, we're going to be joined in studio by Steve Laffey, uh, who is a, um, a uh, Republican uh, presidential candidate. Uh, one you might not have heard of. You know, we hear about, uh, you know, we hear about uh, Donald Trump and we hear about Ron DeSantis and some others. But uh, Steve Laffey. Uh, he's a former mayor of uh, Cranston, uh, Rhode Island, and uh, he's going to be uh, joining us in studio today, and we'll uh, talk with him. Uh, he also used to host a radio show, so I'm interested in asking him about that as well. But uh, so busy show today, lots to uh, lots to do. Uh, it, but uh, I also want to mention too, Jenny is in the chat room and says Shalom peeps from Washington D.C. Yes, uh, Jenny is in Washington D.C. right now. She landed there safely and uh, will be testifying later today. Um, I think it's going to, uh, she said it's uh, supposed to stream on uh, the official uh, Senator uh, Bernie Sanders Facebook page. Uh, she's going to uh, testify in the, uh, for the, uh, or give her uh, presentation or speech, uh, which uh, she did rehearse. And uh, I think it's excellent. So I think, she, I know she's going to do great and I can't wait to see the video, uh, but that will be happening this evening. And then, uh, so she'll be flying back uh, tomorrow. She's going to stay in Washington, D.C. overnight. So very proud of her. Uh, she's doing a great job, uh, the great work that she's doing. So um, can't wait to hear all about her trip. Uh, that's for sure. So great weather for it. At least it is here. Although here it looks like it could, uh, there, there could be thunderstorms. I don't know. But uh, so far the weather's been nice. A little humid, but I don't mind it. I don't mind it at all. So anyway, uh, so we have a couple of great guests uh, coming up today on the program uh, let's go ahead and say hello to everybody quickly in the uh, Facebook live chat. Uh, Jenny, I did mention, is in there. Also, our friend uh, Melanie La Liberty from the great state of Vermont joins us. Uh, also, uh, J Fed, uh, also from Vermont, joins us. And uh, Rhonda Favero, all the way from California, says greetings. Hello, Rhonda. Uh, Melanie says, good luck, Jenny. And uh, J Fed says, great job, Jen Coffee. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. We should mention today, too, so they're meeting again today uh, to uh, for a debt limit discussion, and it looks like Biden is going to be cutting his trip uh, a little bit short overseas. We'll know more. I mean, honestly, we'll probably know before the show is over today. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you remember the last time that they met, it was a relatively brief meeting. I think it was over before the end of the show, and I'm concerned— uh, that today might be similar. Uh, I would really like to see them get this done. I did see this pop up on Politico. 
Uh, centrist Democrats are plotting to uh, a save McCarthy strategy for the debt limit. If the speaker cuts a deal that alienates conservatives, some Democrats are willing to help save his gavel. Now, this is interesting. It says here, uh, Kevin McCarthy faces a clear challenge as he tries to strike a debt limit deal. Any compromise he makes with President Joe Biden risks sparking a conservative rebellion aimed at ending his speakership. Remember, part of what, uh, uh, you know, the, the deal that McCarthy had to make. So finally, on the, I think, the 15th attempt, he could get enough votes uh, to make him speaker. He had to uh, really give away uh, quite a bit. <laughs> And I think it only takes, uh, did it get down to one in the final uh, deal? I think it only takes one Republican congressman to call for a vote to uh, to oust Kevin McCarthy as House Speaker. Um, so it says here, some Democrats have a plan to spare him. And why would they do that, of course? Well, to uh, get the debt limit raised. Uh, you know, if you can get, I mean, this is, um, this would be kind of an end run around the, you know, they used to be the Tea Partiers. Now we call them the House Freedom Caucus, uh, the uh, Republican members of Congress who either want very deep cuts in the budget before they'll agree to a debt limit uh, raising, or they would rather just uh, say uh, default, you know, which apparently is uh, former President uh, Trump's position, as he uh, discussed in the CNN uh, town hall. Might as well default, which I think is insane. <laughs> Um, so it says here, a small group of moderate Democratic lawmakers have quietly reassured its House GOP counterparts that it can help protect McCarthy's gavel if his right flank revolts over a debt agreement, according to two people familiar with the discussions. If conservatives responded to a McCarthy-Biden deal by forcing a full House vote on ousting the California Republican, Democrats say they have enough members to help block it, keeping him in power. Quote, we'll protect him if he does the right thing, unquote, said one of the House Democrats involved in the talks who requested anonymity because of the ongoing debt negotiations. That Democrat added that McCarthy himself has been briefed on the discussions. It's a polarizing strategy for those centrists to entertain and private with other Democrats, let alone admit to planning to deploy. And senior Republicans dismissed the likelihood the gambit would come to pass. That's because it's not clear that conservatives would try to depose the speaker, even if he edges away from the position he's staked out on the debt limit. And should they try to, Republicans from McCarthy's camp on down insist there can be no Democratic bailout. Well, ultimately, he'll do what he has to do to hang on to his, uh, his position as speaker. Uh, McCarthy spokesperson Mark Bednar said in a statement, quote, the speaker has never heard of this garbage, has zero interest in it, and thinks Democrats would be better off focusing on doing the jobs they were elected to do, unquote. Well, of course, he has to say that. <laughs> because even if, even if there have been discussions, even if, even if there have been discussions directly with McCarthy himself, he can't admit that, right? Um, when some Democrats uh, floated a similar offer to then-Speaker John Boehner in 2013, a similar uh, during a similar... A uh, fiscal fight with the GOP within the GOP. He later decided to resign rather than lean on his opponents to keep the gavel. However, it's potential insurance for McCarthy and a sign of the growing sense of desperation on the Hill as the White House and congressional leaders race toward a debt. Uh, I'm sorry, race toward a race toward a deal to avert an uh, an economy rattling debt crisis in the coming weeks. Those who revealed the conversations on condition of anonymity, decline to name who's leading them, but chatter about the Protect McCarthy idea is growing across the Democratic caucus. And it's perhaps the loudest in the bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus. Well, that absolutely makes sense. Um, and it's... Uh, okay, so Democrats and the Problem Solvers. And if you don't know, uh, the Problem Solvers Caucus is a, a bipartisan... Uh, well, I guess actually, well, I guess it's it's actually House members. I'm sorry. Um, you know, uh, whenever whenever Republicans and Democrats do work together in a bipartisan fashion and in, in some sort of an official or quasi official capacity, it has to have a name. Uh, very often, it's referred to as a gang of something. Like there was the Gang of Six, the Gang of Eight, the Problem Solvers Caucus. I think it's a good thing. You know, you want to have uh, you want to have people working together to solve problems. Imagine that.
Democrats in the Problem Solvers Caucus, which has a reputation for attempting to back channel during high level talks, are specifically looking to counterbalance the influence of the roughly 40 ultra conservative Republicans in the Freedom Caucus with their own members. 40 of them, by the way, 40 uh, ultra conservative Republicans in the Freedom Caucus. So that's a lot of people who either think we should go ahead and default, and that is the stated position of some of them, hopefully not many of them, but um, who either think we should default or we need deep, deep cuts in the budget. Uh, the group includes 32 Democrats. Not all of them are involved in the talks about backing McCarthy on a so-called motion to vacate the speakership, but their numbers are nearly enough to neuter the threat from the right. Members of the problem solvers have privately discussed the idea for months, uh, though conversations have become less theoretical as debt talks advanced in recent days, according to both people involved in the conversations. Even outside of that moderate group, however, senior Democrats have also been floating the uh, protect McCarthy idea, even raising it for party leaders, according to three other people familiar with those conversations. And they said some Democrats have suggested to House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries that he use it as leverage over the speaker in the debt negotiations. Jeffries insisted that any game planning for a potential GOP move to topple McCarthy should play no part in the debt debate. Quote, no, I don't think that the two are connected at all, unquote, he said in a brief interview. Well, again, though, even if he knows about it and he thinks it's a good idea, he can't say that. No one can say anything out loud about this until it happens or the whole thing will blow up. Uh, hello uh, to uh, DJ Steve, who joins us in the Facebook live chat. Um, and uh, Melanie uh, made a comment that I can't read on the air, but let's just say uh, she sounds like uh, she thinks uh, Kevin McCarthy is in a, a big heap of trouble. I think the young people say that heap of trouble. Uh, it says here, and Republicans are already rejecting the notion of a Democratic salvage mission for McCarthy should he and Biden ink a pact that alienates conservatives. Uh, Representative Chip Roy, Republican of Texas, who, by the way, was one of the early, uh, early members of uh, early Republicans in Congress to come out and, and endorse Ron DeSantis to, uh, <laughs> over Trump. Um, he, got out, he got out there early and did that. He's an interesting guy, Chip Roy. Uh, he said, quote, we're not talking about all that stuff. Republicans remain united. We're not going to negotiate against ourselves, unquote. Uh, Melanie in the chat room says, thanks, Matt. I thought big heap of trouble would be inappropriate to say in the chat. I hate to be uh, inappropriate in here. I know, Melanie, yes. Uh, you can say big heap of trouble, big heap of trouble. Uh, just don't, as long as you don't say it in, a, in an aggressive tone, because then people get nervous. They're like, oh. Uh, when you say big heap of trouble, is that directed at me? I'm going to have a big heap of trouble. Nobody wants a big heap of trouble. Uh, whether it's a big heap, a small heap, a heaping helping, nobody wants trouble. Yuri, is that you? Sorry. Yeah, of course. Oh, oh, but uh, there is. I think that there isn't the video for you. Yeah, there's no video. We're, we're, we're strictly audio with this. Ah, okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Hey, I'm just glad we were able to connect. I, sometimes... Uh, when it's uh, when we're crossing continents with uh, Skype, it doesn't always work on the first try. We had a band uh, uh, Skype in from Germany a couple of weeks ago, and, uh, and, ah, okay, it, and yeah. it, it, it took a few times to, to get it to work. So that happens. Yeah, okay, but uh, yeah. but I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, for sure. I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, we featured some of your music. Yeah, me uh, too. Nice to meet you. Yes. Thank yes. you so much for the interview and for uh, giving me the opportunity to to be there. So thank you so much. Oh, uh, happy to do it. Uh, how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, Crescenzio. But don't worry, it's, Yuri is fine. Good, <laughs> good. Okay. Or, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Very don't good. worry. Very good. Yeah, first of all, so, sorry for my English because I'm, uh, yeah, you know, I'm Italian, so. Yeah, no worries. No worries. No. <laughs> yeah, just, no. Can, I, can I understand sorry? you? Can I, I can understand you fine. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Ab absolutely. So, um, okay. so we've been playing some of your music. We played some yesterday and it got a really, okay. got a really Thank great response so from the audience. And I opened with one of your songs today too. uh, the, uh, the tracks from, uh, Oberon. Am I saying that correctly? Your, your band? Yeah, it, yeah it's correct. Yeah, it's correct. Yeah. Now in, in Oberon, is that, do you do everything or do you have other musicians who you work with? 
Well, uh, it's, a, it's a project of mine, so it's basically I compose all the music and, yes. uh, and then with other musicians we can, uh, yeah, we, we play it in the studio and uh, yeah, but basically I compose all the music and then I, I share it with, uh, with other musicians mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, that's it, basically. Um... So... Uh, well, uh, in that album, The Sleep Produces Monsters, um, I played guitar and then uh, other people played uh, uh, bass guitar, uh, drums and uh, organs. But uh, I, I, I composed all the music. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, do, do you, um, has it been that way from the beginning with that, that project? You, you write everything yourself or are, are there any co-writers at any point or is it all you? Yeah, no, no. I write, I write everything by, by myself. So yeah, it's, uh, it's my project. And then, uh, I share the music with, uh, with other musicians and then, uh, yeah, we, we record them, uh, we record the music and then, uh, uh, yeah, basically that, that's it. it. It's a my it's uh, it's a project of mine. So it's a uh, like a solo uh, solo project, but uh, with uh, uh, occasional musicians that mm -hmm. play the parts for me uh, that I can play maybe or uh, uh, something like that. So it's um, yeah, it's a, it, it's a solo project, but uh, uh, with other musicians involved. So yeah. <laughs> okay. Um... Now, everything that I've listened to so far uh, yeah. of, of that project is instrumental. Are, th are there any yeah. tracks with vocals or do you strictly do instrumentals yeah, with Oberon? Sure. Uh, well, uh, we, we recorded two albums at mm -hmm. the moment. And uh, the, first, the first one is uh, with, a, um, yeah, with a singer, a female singer. Oh. And uh, the second one is instrumental. So the Sleep Produces Monsters is uh, instrumental. Is uh, an instrumental album. And uh, yeah, uh, during this year, I've uh, I've recorded uh, another album, and in which uh, I will uh, uh, I will sing. So I am the the new. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> and the new um, the new singer of the of the project. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> very good and, uh, very good yeah <laughs> um, yeah basically that so it's a it's an evolving project and um uh, yeah I, I like to uh you know to to evolve myself and to evolve my my music uh into and, and try different things you know so from uh, instrumental music uh, and the, the next album is more uh like uh Pink Floyd, but uh, more uh, more jazz and more uh, a little bit more prog. So it's uh, uh, you know trying different stuff and uh, um, yeah, basically that it, it's it's an evolving project. So uh, it, it's like the the, the progressive rock. Uh, uh, the the the. the mm, I don't know how to say. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the, um, uh, you know that. Um, it 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 can be a challenge to describe your own yeah, music. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. It, it is. It is actually. It is. It is a challenge. So, uh, I try to to evolve myself and to to try to try different things, uh, and uh, and go on with this uh, with this kind of. Uh, uh, of thinking, of, of 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 way of thinking. So, uh, like like it's progressive rock. Uh, so mm -hmm. to uh, to to go uh, to go further and further. So uh, yeah, basically. <laughs> Do you? I I have I have to ask you uh, this. Um, yeah. So we've been playing these tracks from uh, from the newest release. Uh, the sleep uh, produces monsters, yeah. which obviously is a a reference to nightmares is that something or i assume is that something that you've had a problem with uh do you do you have a lot of nightmares do you have difficulty sleeping what what well, what, what was uh, it that inspired this yeah well uh, it was inspired by the 
by a lot of things, I think, because uh, uh, the way I write um, a concept album is more is a is a is a personal way. So there are a lot of things in that, but um, yeah, there are there are a lot of point of view. I think so. Uh, you know, and, and I don't want to to give a, an answer to that question because I think that uh, in art. Uh, uh, there, there are no answers, so sure. uh, I think that uh, yeah, you know um, every people has to to give an answer to uh, to what he sees, to what uh, he, he's listening to. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it's like uh, yeah, it was a trouble period for me, and uh, I wrote this uh, this album uh, to. You know, like um, you know, to uh, like like a way of uh, of uh, of escapism from uh, from the reality, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, to me, it, it's a very personal album. So um, yeah, you know, it, it's a different it's a, it's a different questions. So <laughs> and sure. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a way of uh, of escapism from uh, from a difficult period I had in my life. So yeah, okay, it's it's not so related to nightmare to nightmares, but uh, I think it's related to nightmares in real life. And, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, I think that you can hear it from the from the tunes uh, with uh, especially with guitars. Because it's very guitar, uh, a guitar-driven album, so mm -hmm. uh, you know, so the, this kind of guitar, uh, a fuzzy guitar, uh, it's very impactful. I think mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think you can hear it uh, on the on the record. Mm -hmm. I hope so. Yes. Yes. Um, and I, I noticed in your bio, uh, that, that you sent us, you, you said something about yeah. you, you don't like to necessarily put limits, uh, on what you're yeah. doing musically. Sure. You, you keep it, uh, so does that mean when, when you approach these songs, do you not necessarily say, okay, I want it to sound like this. Is it more kind of an exploratory thing where yeah. you're just seeing where it leads you when you start writing? Yeah, for sure. Definitely like this. I think that, uh, yeah, I don't have limits and I don't, I don't want limits. And uh, it's, uh, it's another thing that uh, I, I love music uh, and uh, I love to work like that. And um, I also love, uh, uh, I think you've, re you've read it uh, in my bio. Uh, I love the, I love the fact that um, I'm starting composing uh, music for films, and uh, yes. and yeah, it's a, it's another territory. It's another uh, um, you know a place to experiment uh, in any ways. So uh, I think it's great because uh, you don't have any limits, and uh, and also in my personal music, I don't want any limits. Uh, you know, uh, like. Uh, uh, a verse, uh, you know, uh, two verse, uh, um, a chorus, a chorus <laughs> obviously, yes. and, uh, you know, the bridge, uh, another chorus, another verse, uh, you know, something like that. I want to be uh, free and uh, without limits in that, uh, um, in, in, when I'm confusing music. So, yeah, it's like that. With uh, composing for a soundtrack, is yeah. is that a big adjustment in the in the sense that it's not just your vision that you have to be concerned with, but also what the film is? Is that a is it difficult to kind of change your approach, or or maybe your approach doesn't change very much? I don't know, but is is well, is, is the process much different? Well, it's not that different, but. Uh... But at the same time, it is so. Um, it depends on your uh, uh, on your on your sensibility, I think, and um, uh, you know, on, 
Yeah, I think it depends on your sensibility because uh, composing music for film, I love I love composing music for films, and uh, uh, I love that the way uh, the music work with uh, with images, mm -hmm. and um, uh, I think it's it's easier for me also because um, when I compose music for my for my projects for my albums. Uh, I start uh, visualizing some uh, some images and then try and then trying to compose music for that for that specific situation or uh, or something like that. So uh, it always starts in my mind with a uh, yeah with a sort of a film or a, or a short uh, images or a, or something like that. But um, you know we are we are always looking for. A, um yeah for 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 the inspiration uh, i think that you can find it uh on the on the feelings on the or uh, on our images but mm -hmm. uh yeah uh, it, I, I think it's easier for me also okay yeah. okay um how many uh how many films have you have you uh written for and, and recorded for so far well, uh, I've done a future film and uh, about, I think, six or seven short films. Oh. So, yeah. So you're... Not bad. <laughs> yeah. So it, it sounds like you're you're doing more of that than than uh, writing your own yeah, music at this point. Years, yeah. In the last few years, uh, I'm, I'm doing so much more um, uh, soundtracks. Yeah. Uh, instead of uh, playing or uh, composing for my project, but um, uh, because I'm uh, recording my my next album for the Oberon project, I'm yeah. I, it's like uh, three years I'm recording it uh, due to the the COVID situation or uh, other problems. But uh, I've just finished it and uh, maybe the next year will come out so hope so and uh yeah but um yeah it takes time yes. <laughs> unfortunately it takes time yeah but uh, uh i'm happy with the results so hopes oh yeah i i think that the next year will come out uh, another album for uh, for the Oberon project so yeah and uh, do you have any um, plans to tour with Oberon, or have you been touring? Well, uh, at the moment, no, because uh, basically I'm I'm a solo artist with uh, uh, friends that help me uh, when I have to to record music, and uh, but uh, maybe you know. Uh, I don't know in the future. <laughs> sure, sure. Maybe the next album will uh, will be uh, uh, I don't know will be better or uh, could give me the the possibility to to tour or to to do some uh, um, you know some some events or uh, some festivals some or I don't know but uh, you know I'm. I think I'm more uh, uh, an uh, orient uh, a studio oriented person so mm -hmm. uh, at the moment I'm uh, I'm concentrating myself to compose music and to to produce new albums mm -hmm. uh, but maybe I I think that there's a, a possibility and uh, we will see the next year maybe so yeah <laughs> hope so yeah obviously yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Yuri, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for, for Skyping in, in, uh, with us. It's, it's wonderful to, uh, talk with you. And, um, you. I, I want to ask you too, do you have new, yeah. um, do you have a new, obviously, you know, you're always working on soundtrack music, but, yeah. um, any idea when your next, uh, Oberon, uh, release will be, or, or is that, well, uh, is that off a ways a bit? I'm working on uh, releasing some uh, new singles uh, on the next few months. So uh, I think that uh, maybe uh, maybe on the half of the next year, uh, a new album will come out. 
definitely. Okay. Oh. And uh, uh, yeah, and two more albums for my project, uh, for my soundtrack project. Uh, so yeah, I'm working on a lot of things, and uh, I can't wait to share with uh, to share them uh, to to the people uh, that can listen to to my music to because i i would love to to start working on something new again so <laughs> you know it's a uh, yeah i i would love to uh, i always love to to produce new music so can't wait to uh, yeah to release to release it mm -hmm. and uh, hope to do so uh, in the next few few months or maybe the beginning of the next year. Yeah. Sure. Great. Well, whenever you do, we'd love to have you back. Uh, like I said, uh, we've, we've been playing. Yeah, for we've, sure. Thank you so much. We've, yeah. We've been playing you on the show and, and to great response. And uh, uh, in fact, in a moment, I'm going to, we're, I'm going to go, uh, when we finish our conversation, I'm going to go back in yeah. time a little and play something from uh, uh, the mountain of fate. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, that'll that, that'll be fun to, to to listen to um listen to how it all started. Uh, this uh, track, "Sailing Oblivion." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, th thank you so much. <laughs> really, it's a uh, it's a really great thing for me, and uh, thank you for so much for your support. Absolutely. And, uh, you, uh, <laughs> thank Yuri, you, Yuri. Before you go, what should what yeah. should listeners know about where to find you online uh, to keep up with your music and everything that you're doing? Well, they can, they can reach me out on uh, Instagram, for sure. Okay. Uh, or Facebook at, uh, you know, the, the Oberon page or uh, Yuri Kress. That is my personal uh, uh, Instagram. Okay. And uh, also on Spotify uh, for, uh, for, the, for listening to the tracks that I've released. And, uh, yeah. Excellent, excellent, and of course you're on Bandcamp as well, and yeah, and, yeah, for sure, Bandcamp, every, yeah, everywhere, sure. everywhere. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very good, very good. Well, Yuri, again, uh, thank you so much for skyping in today, all the way from Italy. Uh, this has been wonderful. Uh, we will definitely, <laughs> <Thanks to you. laughs> absolutely, we will definitely uh, uh, talk with you again uh, when you have some some new music, and uh, I look yeah. forward to hearing it. And uh, I I wish you continued success. Thank you so much. All Thank right. you so much also for the for for the opportunity. Absol <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely our pleasure. All right, Yuri. Thank you. Take care. Thank you so much. Take care. You got it. Bye bye. Bye. All right, wonderful. That was our uh, our new friend Yuri, all the way from Italy, and I'm glad that worked out with Skype. I'll I'll tell you when it's uh when it when it's uh a call coming in from Europe, it never works. <laughs> it never works the first time. But we got there. We got it figured out. Uh, outstanding. So we, we will finish off the segment with um, uh, this track uh, from uh, the first uh, Oberon album, uh, uh, Mountain of Fate. And this is with the singer that he was talking about uh, that he had uh, on this. Um, uh, this is called uh, Sailing Oblivion. And then we'll come back. And I think uh, uh, actually uh, shortly our guest, our uh, our number two Numero Dos guest uh, should be arriving. But uh, we'll see. So. After the song, we might have him here, or it might be a few minutes, and we'll uh, we'll get into some other stuff in the interim, uh, show some love to our sponsors and so forth. But uh, but here it is. Uh, this is Sailing Oblivion from Oberon here on Matt Connerton Unleashed. Check this out. I, I really like what this guy's doing. Welcome back, everybody. This is Matt Connerton Unleashed as we enter our number two, Numero Dos. 
live from the studios of WMNH 95.3 FM in glorious downtown Manchester, New Hampshire, although it looks like it's going to rain. Uh, also on Comcast 97, if you're in Manchester, and hello to all of our online listeners across the nation and around the globe. You can go to my website, mattconnerton.com, for all of your live streaming options, social media links, contact info, show archives, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, today is Tuesday, May 16, 2023, and I am not alone. We have at the news desk, he looks like an actual new. he looks like a news anchor. <laughs> I'm ready to go. <laughs> you do. Steve Laffey is here, a presidential candidate and business man and uh and former radio host from what i read mm -hmm. so i was uh delighted to see that that you are a uh, a brother in broadcast i love it yeah I yeah it's a great story <laughs> yeah well i i do want to ask you about that um i was uh, i was reading up on you and obviously you know we'll talk about your presidential campaign and all that but um a, a couple of things as i was reading about you that i said i definitely have to ask him about this one is is um when you were on the air in providence and um, and the other is and I so I have not read uh, you're also an author, we should mention. Um, I have not read the book uh, that you've written yet, but it is I'm going to put it on my reading list yeah. about your your Senate. People run. still read it. Yeah. Primary yeah. Mistake. Well, the uh, <laughs> the the title really got my attention. And um, I love that kind of stuff. And, you know, I'm a political junkie. So um, so I, I want to ask you about that, too. And uh, Elizabeth Dole got involved, apparently, and uh, all that from what I was reading online. But I, I do want to read the book. And then, you know, hopefully you'll come back in the future and yeah. we, we can have a, a, a deeper discussion about that after um, uh, after I've had a chance to read it. But I do want to ask you a little bit about that today. But uh, if you have any questions or anything at all for our uh, our guest, uh, the uh, Republican, he's a Republican candidate. Uh, for uh, the presidency in 2024, give us a call. The studio line is open, 603-250-6007, 603-250-6007. You can also text me at 617-917-4476. I'm on social media at Matt Connerton. You can interact and opine in the Facebook live chat. Uh, and, of course, you can email me, Matt, at mattconnerton.com. But the best thing to do so that we can hear and enjoy your dulcet tones is give us a call at 603-250-6007. Our friend uh, Melanie La Liberty uh, from the great state of Vermont in the chat room says, he looks super serious. I'm kind of scared. <laughs> well, well, he is a presidential candidate. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, and, uh, now, are you... Um, are you going to be on the ballot in New Hampshire? Is that, oh, yeah, I'll be is, on the ballot is, in New Hampshire. Is that I, was the, just, I was the first person to take on Donald Trump. February 1st, I announced. And uh, I, listen, the nation just refuses to directly confront these problems, giant problems. I mean, if I get one more email from another Republican tell me all oh, Democrats are Marxists, send them money, I'm going to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, we need serious people, and the time is right for a financial expert, me, who has my unique background we can get into, Yeah, yeah. to fix these problems. I, I don't really do anything but fix problems. I mean fix, like really fix, do, and make people vote my way. That's what I do. do. Do you feel that Donald Trump is unserious? Yes. <laughs> and, and I think it's been even well, what happened last Wednesday. We don't have to get into all his stuff. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, it just it's not serious stuff. Yeah. You're, you're referring to the town hall. Uh, I mean, really, people laughing when he's talking about a, a oh, conviction I know. of a woman who I don't know anything about. I don't know. Really. I don't pay much attention to it. Yeah. But, you know, Pete, what's the what's who they're not my fellow Republicans in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, we haven't been a serious country for many, many years. But certainly not under Bush, Obama, Trump, or Biden. We've spun out of control. And I hate to say we'd love to have Bill Clinton back so we can get some kind of a balanced budget. But, but, but the, debt, the debt now is simply too big. And so my background is just, we can get into it, my background yeah, yeah. is just unique. I, I wanted to mention, you mentioned uh, Bill Clinton. And uh, do you know Greg Moore uh, from the New Hampshire's uh, chapter of Americans for Prosperity? No, I don't. I, I haven't. Uh, he's, um, you'll probably meet him at some yeah, point. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, he, he's been on the show. He hasn't been on in a long time. I haven't seen him in a long time, but I remember him saying something once about, uh, he said that Bill Clinton was actually the last fiscally conservative president that we ever had, Yeah, you know, because he did leave us with a, a balanced budget and a surplus actually. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and then of course, uh, W came in and we went to war and, <laughs> yeah. and we didn't you, win everything I mean, the problem with, you know, Bush in the, in the second Bush is we went to war, but we didn't win immediately. Like, it went on for years. Yeah. I was the first, by the way, in my U.S. Senate race in 06, I was the first Republican to call for Don Rumsfeld's resignation. No kidding. 
and I got all this national attention, but I didn't realize I was the first one. I mean, I, really, I must say, now that I look back at some of these things, yeah, uh, how was I the first one to do this? Like, it was a it was a terrible job, right? It's the same thing with the Federal Reserve today. We need their resignation. Like, Matt, if you're in a business and you're off by a factor of four or outside three standard deviations of normalcy, like they want inflation at two, but it ran at eight for a year and a half. Mm-hmm. I mean, in June of 2021, the head of the Fed says it's going to run at three and a half by the end of the year. It, it's 7.4. These are like when you don't have to, we don't have to fire you. You need to come in with your resignation. <laughs> and, and they don't. There's no right. apology. The middle class people out walking the streets I see today, you know, spent $4,000 more on energy course mm-hmm. last oh, year. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's awful. And, yeah. and by the way, just so people know, when inflation finally ends, whenever that is, whenever the Paul Volcker shows up again, mm. Um, they don't ten, they don't send you the money back. They right. took they took it. It's <laughs> True. gone. True. But anyway, well, let me ask yeah. you. I I do have uh, questions about your background. And um, so uh, yeah, tell me about uh, yeah. you hosted a show uh in it was in Providence, correct? Yeah, a radio show, a weekly show. I, I so can I? Why don't you tell me my quickly my just my real background? Oh so please, yeah. Right. We, we, so we I'm, got... a, I'm a relatively poor kid from Cranston, Rhode Island, who at 18 went to went to Bowdoin College up in Maine. I'm from Rhode Island, so pretty you know I've been in New Hampshire. Hundreds of times. Yeah, right? yeah. I've been at Ruggles Mines with kids. I've been there when I was a kid, right? So I, I ended up at Harvard Business School at the age of 22. Okay. I was a direct admit. I graduated. I spent most of my career, almost all my career, in the financial field. This is the key. I helped run a financial firm, the largest one in the South. I was the president, the chief operating officer. I started and ran the venture capital operations. Okay. All this was successful. We sold the firm for $785 million. When Alan Morgan, wonderful man, the CEO, we I... My power of conviction, we convinced them in an hour, I did, to sell a firm he was never going to sell mm. because it was best for the shareholder. Yeah. It was best for him, He's a, but it wasn't best for me in a sense. I left. I went to Stowe, Vermont. I was going to start a hedge fund. Should have maybe went to Loon Mountain, but I went to Stowe, Vermont. <laughs> and, and so, and so uh, I just had this vision. I should go to Cranston. My wife, who's with me today, and some of our kids, we went the next day. Yeah. And Cranston went bankrupt. Cranston around effectively didn't declare bankruptcy because I became the mayor. But it was borrowing three-month money at 15%, the worst bond rating in the United States of America the day before I was elected. Nobody knew who I was when I came home. I hadn't been home in 20 years, 18 to 38. Yeah. And we fixed it in the most rapid financial turnaround. And while I was doing that, I taught the top finance course at the University of Rhode Island. Hear the word finance? Like, I know money. This is what I do. And that's why the time is right. Like, in the the 70s— the time was right for Jimmy Carter to become president. He was Mr. Clean. He was a really good guy. Yeah. I mean, things overcame him as presidency yeah, and so yeah. forth. But, but, but after Watergate, and by, but in November of 75, people didn't know who he was. Right. And so I decided this is my time. We, 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 should, we should mention, too, you won re-election in Cranston, yeah. right, with like 65%. By the widest margin in Cranston's history, I'm yeah. a fairly conservative populist Republican in the most Democratic state. You know, maybe you're not Vermont, but— Hardcore, you know, state hard to get elected as a Republican. No statewide elected offices have been elected since I left. So after I left, you know, and I ran for the U.S. Senate in 06. Yeah. And it was the biggest race in the country. That's why I have a big book deal with Pegwood Books. Yeah. And my book, Primary Mistake, is still read by many people, especially when they get ready to run. Yeah. I get calls from people all over the country or friends. Hey, this guy's running for governor. This guy's running for House of Representatives. He just read your book. And is it really like that? I'm like, yeah, it really, <laughs> it really was like that. So the na- I am the only elected Republican to be attacked when running for higher office, according to Craig Shirley, Reagan's biographer. He wrote an article about it in 06. Yeah. To be attacked by the National Republican Party. That's me, Steve Laffey. Okay. <laughs> they, they preferred a person who was far to the left of Nancy Pelosi in a Republican primary. Now, if you're in a Democratic primary, that looks good in Rhode Island. But Lincoln Chafee. Yeah. So they attacked me with millions of dollars. Um, he's, and, an, he's an odd guy. And yeah, he's a very, very <laughs> odd guy. By the way, he's couldn't be a nicer guy if you talk about horses. That, the, I, I, no, I've heard, I've uh, heard, I've never met him. I've heard he's very nice, but just, I, I just, uh, he's, he seems odd. Yeah. Start talking to him about, <laughs> listen, he ran for president. He wanted to do the metric system. I'm running for president <laughs> to fix social security. I remember. Right? So <laughs> it's a vastly different, you know, yeah. I have these five things that have to be done to fix the country. We can talk about. Yeah. But in 07, and I, I, after I lost, I wrote a book. And it's, that's what happened. And in, and in 2010, I told the people of Rhode Island, really, and I say this very seriously, you really only want me, Rhode Island, where I'm from, if you have a financial problem and you want to fix it. Cranston did, Rhode Island doesn't, I'm on my way. I, w- I moved to Fort Collins, Colorado, and I raised 
I have six children, by the way. Yeah. And uh, so I have a unique background in education where I've homeschooled my own children in healthcare. I homeschooled them because my daughter came down with stage four cancer. That's why for eight or nine years, you haven't heard from me. Okay. My, my beautiful wife here, she went to the hospital for 200 nights a year oh at the God. children's hospital. And she's alive, my daughter. She's graduating Good. from BU grad school. Excellent. A week, uh, no, not a week, in five days on Saturday. She still has cancer. Oh, so wow. if you go to stevelaffey.com and you read some of my sub stacks, yeah. the person who corrects that is Sarah Grace Laffey. Okay. She's alive. She's 26. She's going to get married, but she still has cancer. Okay. The brave person. So I've seen five to seven million dollars of healthcare costs cross my desk, which I didn't have to pay, but a lot of people do. Yes. So with my kids, I personally have homeschooled them. The last three are all sophomores at Colorado State University. One is 15 years old. He's the youngest admitting in the school's history. Because I homeschooled them. So I know education. I know what goes on in the public schools. I've dealt with antagonistic school committees. Mm -hmm. All these things we can talk about. But my background is unique to be able to help the country at this point. Mm -hmm. And if all I really do is change the direction of the Republican Party so someone takes this seriously rather than a joke, Mm -hmm. or try to be the mini Trump and not have answers for people like you when you come on. But yes, to be directly about 2005, (laughs) uh, WPRO, the powerhouse station down there, you know, yeah. uh, wanted me to always have a show. Yeah. And they thought I would lose my Republican primary for mayor, but I didn't. And so the very good people. Yeah. And I love doing I did lots of radio. I've hosted for lots of people. I filled in for people like you all over oh, no, the country. Kidding. Oh, yeah, yeah. I just walk in and do, do shows. Yeah, yeah. So I did the Steve Laffey show because um, uh, Mr. Cass, uh, who had the biggest show, you know, the most popular guy. He didn't want. He was older. He didn't want to come in on Friday, and uh, <laughs> so I came in. So the Steve Laffey show was started. Now, okay, the big story about it, why it was a national story, was that the Democrats who kind of run the board of elections mm-hmm. decided that I could not have a show. Think about it. I can be the mayor. I can brush my teeth. Right. Right. At the same time, I can have a radio show. I can write an op-ed piece. It's called free speech. Yeah. But they were so crazed by what I was talking about in the radio, which was widely popular. The r- lines are full. People that either hated me, loving me, you know. Yeah. And if they'd only asked, like, Steve, when are you going to get off? I would have said, when I announced for the U.S. Senate. That's my employee. I would have told them. Oh, okay. But so they you- sued me yeah. to stop me from having a radio show. And the federal judge in Rhode Island, Judge Lisi, who didn't wasn't who said she wasn't really up on the sec- uh, you know, the First Amendment, I don't know how she got to be a judge, but she, she agreed with them. So I went to the first court of appeals, one step away from the Supreme Court in two weeks. And in that ruling, three judges heard the case yeah, and literally said something like to the other side, hey, listen, it's Thursday, it's 12 noon. By Monday morning, Laffey's on the radio. Wow, okay. Well, we don't want to hear another word about this. Really? Okay. This, they basically said it's the dumbest thing they ever heard. And you need to w- deal with your murky rules down there. We, we, but what, the, was, what was the grounds under which they sued you? That, I'm not clear on that. That I was, a, that I was actually an elected official. Now, oh. it made no sense. There were a lot of le- elected officials. By the way, Rudy Giuliani had a, had a radio show. Yes. He was mayor. Lots of people around the country did. Yeah. In Rhode Island, many of the elected officials couldn't talk that well, so I guess they didn't. But it wasn't <laughs> unusual in the country, right? Right. So that was the case that went to. It was all big national story. But is there an actual law on the books there, no, or did they, they just? No, they just made it up. Oh, and that's wow. why they slapped them around so hard. Okay. And just said it's. Oh, we don't even want to write a ruling. Just he goes back on the air. If he's not on by Monday morning, we're going to have to take another action. Yeah. And so that. And then I got off after a couple of more weeks because I ran for the U.S. Senate. So that was your, your. So you were intending to when you announced yeah. your Senate run. You were yeah. Atten- that was my implicit them. agreement. I didn't have yeah. to legally get off then. Yeah, yeah. But being the only U.S. Senate candidate, what would be a big time race? Right, right. Uh, WPRO and I, we just sort of implicitly said, I said, listen, if I go run for higher office, which they knew I was going to, yeah, then I'll get off the week before, and I did. Yeah, yeah. So that's my uh, radio. That's my radio show. But you know, the country today needs a financial expert, not a real estate developer. We need these. If you're listening to this show and you're like 40 or under, it must be quite the thing to get your Social Security FICA thing and know you're not getting it. Like, let's say someone out there is making 50 grand. Say they're making 100 grand. Say whatever they're making. Mm -hmm. They're making 100 grand and they're 40. They're getting 12 grand taken out and they're not going to get it. But at SteveLaffey.com, we have a complete plan to fix it. Not to like just say we're going to raise the retirement age like Nikki Haley and she doesn't know how she doesn't know anything about it. Did she say that? Yeah. Okay. 
But she doesn't know what to raise it to because she doesn't spend any time on it. Yeah. Or Donald Trump say, I'm not going to touch it. That's just immoral, financially immoral. The governor of Florida, not going to touch it. Now, when he was a congressman, he wanted, to, he wanted to hack it. But we don't need to do either. We need to modernize it, strengthen it, especially for the 20-year-old entering the work system. They need to get, I, by the way, I wrote a paper about this in economics in yeah. 1983. Oh, wow. I know about this. Yeah. Like, the, the returns have been terrible for people getting it. Yeah. So just remember, if you go to stevelaffey.com, what we're going to do, we're going to take the 20-year-olds and put them in a new system. Everybody 62 and old is going to get what we promised them. And the people in between are going to get a, going to get a hybrid. Some of the old, some of the new. But if you're 20, you're going to get five, six, seven times, eight times more. And if we don't do this $61 trillion unfunded liability, like this is how we fix it, if we don't do it, Matt, you, you're going to get a check one day, but it's just going to be the $1,800 they promised you in that letter <laughs> they sent you. It'll be $1,800 10 years from now, 20 years from now. It'll just be $300. Is this um because uh, inflation is is what you're proposing and and by the way I'm I'm bad at math so if you throw a number uh, I mean you can throw numbers at me I might miss a lot but the audience is I have a <laughs> I have a smart audience right. whatever I don't get right. they, they'll they'll be able to figure out but um it, are it, this sounds like tell me if I'm right is this um because uh, during the W administration it was yeah. briefly talked about but the idea didn't really go anywhere at the time uh, privatizing Social Security is yeah. that what you're suggesting no I'm not want to privatize at all. So let's just take the 20-year-old. We're going to take 10% of his pay. We're going to put it in a mixture of stocks, bonds, real estate, everything. But what? But isn't that privatization? No. Okay. He doesn't know. He doesn't get it. It doesn't go to Charles Schwab. That's that's what Bush wanted to do. He wanted to privatize oh. it. It lasted six days. Yeah. He only lasted six days, and he gave up. That's because <laughs> that's because he didn't have a, he didn't have a real program. He never really thought it through. So. If you take any 40, 45 year period, so let's say you're 20, here's what happened. You're tw let's start with a 20 year old. Mm -hmm. He gets to be 30, he gets married. The sexist nature of what goes on in Social Security, Social Security today, listen to this, ladies. When it was designed, if you're not married for long enough, you don't get some of your husband's Social Security. Does everybody realize this? If you're married to someone for five years, yeah, and he makes a million or the max, and you're staying home raising children, yeah, you don't get it. Really? Yeah, you got to be married for a certain amount of time. Okay. To to grab your husband. Now, it could be the other way around these days. It could be I'm talking the 1950s. Now it could right. be a woman working, the father staying right. home, whatever. But implicitly, it was it, it's it's unfair. So let's say now you get married at 30, and divorced at 40. Yeah. You're both exactly 30. To make it simple, you split what you're putting in. Yeah. And when you divorce, you split it again. You just don't worry about it. Right. You, now you die at 40, unfortunately. Your ears get it. Okay. It doesn't go to the federal government, but you get to be 62. Now we stop buying annuities with 10% of it per year or 15% per year. So when you turn 70, everybody who's left has got a really large check. It's not privatized. It's in one computer. Mm -hmm. Charles Schwab, JP, especially J.P. Morgan, they never get a hold of it. Because what happens in 401k plans with people who are 23, 26, they switched, you know, that was designed when people stayed at IBM for 40 straight years and got a golden watch. Oh, yeah, those days are gone. And now people are switching jobs and cashing out. Right, right. And so what's going to happen? We're going to have a giant problem in 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So here's the problem or the problem people could call in about. Can anybody get less, Mr. Laffey, Mayor Laffey, Steve Laffey? <laughs> yes. The guy who's 53 who goes into this system the day I we do it. Okay? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, the difference between me is I'm actually going to do this. So at the end of this thing, you might say, what's the first thing you're going to do, Steve Laffey? I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. Like people say, I just talked about it for an hour, but I'm going to do this to save our children because we 60-year-olds have taken way too much from our kids. So you're 53, you go into the new system, but you're still getting the old system. Mm -hmm. Whatever it said you're going to get at 53, you're going to get that. Okay. But you have seven, 10 years nine years to go to the new system. Could you get less? Yes, we could have nine bad years. Biblically, we could have seven straight bad, bad well, years. I was going to say, is, is, yeah. there, is, is there not an element of, of risk to this? There's not really any real, by the way, let's compare the risk to staying with doing what we're doing when they cut your check by a third in 2030. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, right, right. So, so let's take the risk that's really there. There's $61 trillion of unfunded liabilities, double our national debt. So what that means for anybody is that the $61 trillion means discounting from to the today, mm -hmm. out from the future, what we're taxing, 
and what we say we're going to pay out. Yeah. The difference is 61 trillion. So it's so it's going to it's just, it's imploding in front of our face. Like it's it's over. Like you're not going to get it or they're going to run inflation so high that like I say when you get it it won't be worth anything. So why don't we just fix it? Well, part of the problem too if if I under, and again I'm I'm far from an expert on this. But um we have an aging population yes. and and obviously and and birth rates are plummeting. Yes. So there's going to be just I mean it's just common sense yes. there's going to be more and more people And so to another pay reason out. that we just can't have the future people getting it from the present people today. What happens today is that when we started social security 1933 a temporary program by Roosevelt, right? Mhm. Never meant to be all your retirement, but say it is, whatever. We're living into today. We're not living in 1880. I'm talking to my fellow conservatives now who want to end it. We're not doing that. We're going to fix it. We're going to modernize it. We're going to make it okay. But but what happens is now there's three workers, but those three workers are sending the money directly to Social Security re- recipients today. So what's going to happen is that 40 years from now, when they erect a statue in my name because everybody's got a great, great job, you know, and Social Security's working out really well. I'm joking, okay? What's going to happen is that the people who are 62 today are going to be dead. But the people today just have their system. We don't even talk about it anymore. If they've owned some New Zealand right. bonds, some real estate, not in Russia probably, but they own some real estate in Europe. They own some stocks. They own, they own some Volkswagen. They own some, all these things together, bonds. They're going to do better than anybody's ever done. They have, unless the world ends. Yeah, yeah. And if the world ends, we're not going to talk about it. Right. The world has ended. Right. <laughs> so there's no 40 year period where this wouldn't have massively outperformed. Again, I wrote a paper about 83. The numbers I came up with then are still the numbers today. So that, of course, that's not the only thing we have to do. You know, this inflation stuff has to stop. We, we've got a situation where the Federal Reserve. And for people who don't know this, and again, I'm not saying people, everybody spends their time like I do on it, but mm-hmm. there's nobody running for president who wants to fix the Federal Reserve. Some people want to end it, but we're not going to end it. I hear in uh, in libertarian circles, I, I often hear about audit, this phrase, yeah, audit, audit the, the Fed. Fed. We, yeah. sh- we should audit the Fed. It's, all that stuff I've, is I've true. heard Rand Paul talk about it. And Rand Paul is correct, and I would prefer a gold standard, but the first step to get back to some sense of normalcy is for the Fed to only concentrate on inflation and keep it at zero. One goal. Right now they have what we call a dual mandate. It's really one long paragraph, but people refer to it as a dual mandate because the Fed, starting in the late 60s, 70s, used to just do inflation. But then they put in that they should try to keep employment high or unemployment low. Mm -hmm. They call full employment. Yeah. Well, folks, they have like, not to get into Algebra 2 and bore people, but if you can remember back to Algebra 1, there were like these, three unknowns and two equations and you couldn't solve. They can't solve that problem. And so what's been happening? We've had way worse situations because the Fed has been worried about employment and inflation. The people worried about unemployment have to be the people in Congress. What they've done Mm -hmm. is handed their power to the Fed. And that's why they've never called for their their resignation. They've handed the power of fiscal power to the Fed Reserve. So if the Fed Reserve was only worried about inflation, and the job was to keep it at zero. And I can mm-hmm. get 17 people from my high school buddies to do this. Yeah. It's not, listen, it's not that hard. There, there are, there are, I don't want to quote the Taylor rule from John Tandrell at Stanford. There's lots of ways that we know about money supply to keep inflation at zero. But when you're also worried about employment, you let infl- inflation run too hard. That's what happened in 2020. They were worried about a collapse. They should not have been. They should have been keeping inflation at zero. Well, it, but in 2020, I mean, that was such a, I mean, you know, the pandemic just, I, if, I like to say, it, you know, it took the, the puzzle and just threw all the pieces in the air. <laughs> we were in such uncharted did, territory. It should have been the Fed's problem to yeah. overreact about employment. It should have been the senators and House of Representatives people if they wanted to do something, if they wanted to backstop unemployment, which is all they really had to do. They didn't. They did much more. The PPP program is full of nothing but fraud. There are law firms in New England who each partner got $56,000. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And so they did that, and Donald Trump signed that, and I was against all of that, but the governor of Florida was for it. Nikki Haley was for it. The president was for it. Vice President Pence was for it. Mike Pompeo was for it. They were all for it because a very quick and easy thing to get their friends' money. Mm -hmm. Really rich people took advantage of it. Really poor people got a check for $1,400. 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And their inflation was four thousand dollars more per year for two years. A few of the rich people did give back the money, but that's just because they got caught. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. It's true. Yeah. So, so this is the serious nature of running for president that we're having. Yeah. That other people aren't having. Can, can I ask you, though, about inflation? And, and again, I'm far from an expert, but um, isn't a, a big part of the problem there's all this price gouging going on? And 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 by, and by the way, I have no idea what you do about that, but, but isn't <laughs> right. that a big part of what's going on? No. Because I feel like this is my perception. Yeah. There's a lot of price gouging. The mainstream media doesn't talk about it because, you know, they're part of, of this mm-hmm. uh, th- this uh, corporate uh, ecosystem. Um, because the only way I learn about it is through alternative alternative media, you know, and, and these these numbers. Uh, and again, a lot of it's over my head. But um, but it seems to me like so uh, prices have been artificially raised to some degree. Uh, the, the media for the most part ignores it because like I said, they're, they're part of this, this whole corporate apparatus. And then we're just sort of fed this thing, um, that, uh, you know, and and by the way, I, I understand, you know, there's other factors too. Like I said, the pandemic really just threw everything up in the air, but, but isn't that, isn't that part of it? The, the price gouging? No, price gouging is one of the things that, you know, people talk about, but it's really a very small problem. I mean, For example, look at uh, Tyson Foods recently. The President Biden said they were price gouging a year ago. Their profits are falling off, they're going down, the price is going down. They're not price gouging. Now, price gouging among chief executive officers of large corporations, price gouging the shareholders, been going on for 30 years. Mm -hmm. They make way too much money. (laughs) They and by operating out of China and taking jobs out of Manchester. Right. For 30 years, for 30 years, this has been going on. Yeah. They've been gouging the CEOs and that's been okayed by Republicans and Democrats. But price gouging. Listen, the truth is, if the price of butter went up, you buy margarine. There's a lot of substitutes for a lot of things. But what happened is that the money supply for 2010 to 2020 money supply went up at about 5 percent. What we call the velocity of money. How many times it turns over? Like if you're Mm -hmm. in Venezuela right now or in Argentina, Argentina inflation, 100 percent. If we wake up in Argentina and some you hand me some Argentina whatever, lira, whatever they call it, yeah. I spend it as quickly as possible because by the end of the day, it's going to lose 10% of its value. So I'm going to buy an apple. I'm going to yeah, We're yeah. going to do it. Yeah. In America, that's not what's going on. The velocity went down 5% per year. Be, not to get, again, I don't want to get too technical, but I know this stuff. Yeah. The Fed Reserve didn't let the velocity go up because it paid banks not to lend. So the economy grew slowly. Not didn't grow, it grew slower. One of the reasons. But in 2020, the money supply went up 20% very quickly. Now, just picture, picture a scene where we all wake up tomorrow morning. It happens overnight. Mm-hmm. Everybody's got 20% more money in every bank account overnight. Well, the guy who figures it out first makes out like a bandit. Right. <laughs> he buys that house in Florida. You and I show up a month later like, too bad. Price is up. Some prices were up 40%. Right. Or something's didn't go up. Right. Then you do have the supply chain problem. Right. You have the problem of what's happening out of China. They close their economy. We depend way too much on prescription drugs, on things from China. I've been oh, fighting yeah. about this. By the way, my movie is, I, I travel the country, this movie. And if you watch Fixing America, my movie at oh, Amazon. Yeah. I can, uh, for, for our Facebook uh, viewers, in fact, I can I'll put that camera on me for a moment and yeah. hold it up. Yeah, you brought me this uh DVD fixing America. This is um, and this is currently available on Amazon, correct? Sure, Amazon. You can stream it. It's an old movie, but if I, if if you if you don't show the debt clock to somebody in the movie, you wouldn't know I didn't make it yesterday. <laughs> it's me traveling the United States of America, talking to regular folks like here in Manchester about China, about the debt, yeah, about energy. That, by the way, that's something I think everybody can agree on. Uh, you, you know that we need to rely a lot less on China for things like prescription yeah. drugs and, uh, and and but here's the problem, I've been talking about this since 2005 publicly made a movie yeah. about it. Yeah, my Republican Party is finally sort of coming around to understand this, right? And the reason it takes so long is that Deere and Company, big giant Walmart, mm-hmm. they made their CEO, so much money on the backs of workers here in America mm-hmm. losing their jobs. Yep. But that's how they did it. Yeah. Now, it's unusual for a Republican to say this, but, this, but, it, ha- but it happens to be the truth. Yeah. And I've been wanting to stop this for a long time. And by the way, it's starting to stop anyway. China became a one-person rule company. One person runs that company. It's a dictatorship now. It's not even a communist party, right? So 
we're going to be bringing stuff home anyway. This supply chain stuff's stopping. Like, it's not going to be coming from China. So we need to be the leader in logistics and bring this right. stuff back to America, Canada, Mexico. Some stuff is better to be in one of the countries near us. Right. But it's better for Americans because the one thing that is true about manufacturing jobs, and my father was a toolmaker. I watched him lose his job, lose part of his work during the Japanese thing in the 70s. You know, the Japanese oh, was taken over. The uh, yeah, auto the, manufacturers. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, I mean, Armbrust Chain, where he worked, Harry Armbrust kept everybody working, but maybe 20 hours a week sometimes. Maybe they oh. closed for seven. He wanted to keep everybody there. My yeah. father was the shop steward. So I lived this growing up. About, okay. You know, I lived it was tight financially, all these kind of things. Yeah. So, but it never stopped happening because China took over. So, but a, but a manufacturing job coming back to America is four jobs. What do I mean by that? You open up a manufacturing concern over here to make bicycles. Schwinn Bicycle comes back and starts making them over there, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, someone shows up and serves coffee, right? They need they need some parts of handles yeah. from some guy up in uh, Littleton. I don't know where, right? Or, or over in Bath, Maine or something, right? So a manufacturing job is the biggest job creator, and mm -hmm. we need them to come back. Now, will they all come back? No. I mean, can China still make T-shirts? Great if they want to make T-shirts. But a lot <laughs> of high-tech stuff has to come back to America. Yeah. And I'm a guy who buys, by the way, everything you can look at here is made in America. And I didn't do it for the show. This, this tie was made by bow ties in Vermont. I do think, too, I, I mean, I, I would say, uh, you, you know, obviously uh, you're a Republican, but I think you can probably reach a lot of Democrats with that yes, message, too. I do. Because I do think there's a lot of uh, unanimity on the idea that we <laughs> just have to stop to, uh, depending on China, especially with, I, you know, I hope it doesn't come to this ever, but, you know, the possibility of war in the future and yeah. so forth or or if they decide to move on Taiwan and then we're involved, and uh, the, which is, these are nightmare scenarios that right. I don't like to and we think gotta, about. We gotta, as, as a leader, we have to try to avoid these things, but yeah. we, have to, we have to know that Mrs. Jones out here, and she needs Tylenol, or she needs Lipitor. I don't know what she needs, but we know that 90% of it, the active ingredients and stuff is still made in China today yeah no in 2020 again the talking politicians the tom cotton from the republican party probably a great guy he talked and talked and talked about it mm -hmm. he didn't do anything about it right, right. so in this country by and, the way and now we're facing medication shortages yes yep. and that's and that this this is the kind of stuff that i know how to fix yeah that I, this is what we're, we're talking serious stuff yeah so far we're not talking about dastardly democrat i mean it it's gotten to the point now where there's so many disconnected people, they don't think it can change. Mm -hmm. it, it goes to our, uh, our campaign finance laws, for example. When I was making the movie in 2011, this is what my conservative friends always disagree with me about, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And I'm a, I'm a pretty conservative guy, by the way, but because I think that's what works. But when I talk to them about campaign finance laws and I say, listen, I'm going through Youngstown, Ohio. I could have been in Nashua, New Hampshire, but people generally have like, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks they want to put into a campaign over a year if they want to help somebody. Yeah. But then they read George Soros on the left has $60 million for a race, and the Koch brothers on the right have $70 million for a race. Mm -hmm. And they're like, what is my 50 bucks going to do? So that yeah. needs to change. Yeah. It needs to be, that, that needs to stop. Mm -hmm. It can't be that special interest, unknown people, 501c4s, and no one knows who they are, they can't be funding Dark money, yeah. We just got to stop it, and it's yeah. just gonna have to be some. There's gonna be some limit we got to put on it. You Go know, ahead. you know what I always say though, too, about this, and this is an unpopular opinion. Uh, I think that um, as much as we all complain about it, um, you know, we talk about it a lot on this show. I also think though that uh, the American people, we need to take more the onus ourselves of actually just doing the research because it's not hard to do. Mm -hmm. I always say if you go to a, like a great website, OpenSecrets.org, yeah, great website. You go to a website like that and you look up a, a candidate uh, or someone who's currently in office and you can find out who who actually it is public information, except for the dark money, the, the yeah. you know, the, the shadowy packs that's got to go. But uh, but as far as uh, companies, organizations, law firms that are actively donating to these campaigns, lobbyists, you can find that out. And I always tell people once you know who's donating to these candidates or the or people who are currently in office. Once you know that, then you know exactly who they actually work for because they damn sure don't work for us. That's right. You know, and they have it for a long, long time. Right. I mean, 
you you're you got hit the nail on the head. This has to change. This is about the corruption that goes on, mm-hmm. and it's not the corruption when people get arrested. It's the PPP program, the PayPal. It's that. It's the Wall Street Journal wrote four giant articles starting five months ago to like three months ago. They wrote four articles about not even about elected officials front running trade. Yeah. They wrote about the agency people, the guys who work at the Department of Energy, mm-hmm. who meet with Chevron coming in. And mm-hmm. They're going to allow some drilling or whatever. 2,600 of them front running people who have to show up in front of them, publicly traded companies. So my policy is vastly different. And you won't hear anybody else say this. Yeah. But we want to align the president, the vice president, the Congress, the senators, whatever, with the American people. If all of them couldn't do blind trust, mm-hmm. blind trust, really, come on. If someone's, it's, they're not blind. Well, it's a joke, right? When, um, when, when Mitt Romney was running, we yes. heard that we suddenly heard that phrase uh, quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Call it a blind trust. It's, it's yeah. silly. Yeah. What if they all had to keep their money at banks, like most people do, yeah. in the U.S. dollars? Let me ask everybody a question. You think they would have paid you zero on your interest from 2009 mm. to 2021? Or would they paid you three or four percent? Three or four percent, like it used to be. The, the powers that be, by keeping rates too low, took a trillion dollars out of the people listening to this show over 12 years. The guy who's like, hey, I got, I make 60 grand, but I save 40 grand. I want to buy a home. I used to, you know, that guy used to get $1,200. At yeah. zero. So yeah. the twelve hundred dollar, the, the missing twelve hundred dollars didn't allow him to have enough lobbying power to go down to what would take him twelve hundred dollars to get a hotel room for two nights to go see his congressman, right? Yeah. So he didn't do it. <laughs> but the really, really yeah. rich guy was like, "Wow, it's the greatest thing ever." Yeah, I own all these stocks. They're going to go up because the alternative investment is zero. It used to be five percent. I own, I own gold. I own silver. I, whatever. They're, they're going to make a lot of money. They did. Yeah. But the average American got hosed. Yep. So we stop it. That's what I want to do. These are serious, serious things that if we could align. And by the way, I have a gift for this. This is what I'm good at. If you would call people in, in Rhode Island and say, they'll say I didn't like Laffey. You know, I didn't like him. Blah, 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 blah. They mm-hmm. won't say I was wrong. Yeah. There's no article <laughs> that you looked up that some guy said, you know what? Financially, he did the wrong thing. There's not an article. That's true. I didn't. Yeah, you didn't I'd, find one. That's true. At I, Morgan I, Keegan. I did, I did oh, the research. There was a palace coup. There was this. Yeah. There was no article saying, wow, that guy, he made a bad decision running that trade. Today. There's no there's no article. <laughs> right. I have a gift for this. I don't have a gift. Yeah. I can't change a light bulb. I <laughs> fell off a ladder. I had to finally sell my tractor. I could barely drive it. I stink at a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> but this stuff, putting the right person in the right position to do the best job, that's my gift. Yeah. Getting to the heart of a matter and forcing other people to vote my way, that's my gift. Um, I want to look at the, uh, the, I don't know if there's, um, I thought I saw a question for you in the uh, chat room. Well, you know what I wanted to ask you while, yeah. I, while I look for that is, uh, oh, yeah, it was about, um, someone had asked a question in here. Uh, it's hard to find, it's a busy chat room today. But somebody had asked about uh, schools. Yeah. And you had mentioned homeschooling. And um, I had read, uh, you were talking about, it, is it is it true? Is, is it still your position? You want to actually eliminate public schools yes, ultimately? Not tomorrow morning, but yes, I think that, that, that let, me go, let me go through this with people because oftentimes even in New Hampshire, which is, by the way, a, and there are many good schools. I mean, yes. relatively good schools, right? So, oh, yeah, yeah. So, but for the nation as a whole, by the way, if the local people want to keep their schools, go ahead. It's just that the state and the feds, what are they really doing? How have they improved things? So, so think about it. From 1962 on, our test scores are going down. Last week, our history scores for eighth graders found that 13%, thir- not 33, 13% of eighth graders in the United States of America were proficient in history, mm. knowing who George Washington was. 20% were proficient in civics. Do we have a democracy? Do we have a monarchy? They didn't know. Now, people listening today may be listening to a school somewhere in New Hampshire where 60 or 65 percent of the kids are proficient which is still by the way terrible it's terrible but that means in denver memphis detroit jacksonville we got numbers near zero because to get to 13 percent you got to have some places like in los angeles in los angeles during the pandemic they didn't know what happened to 25 percent of the kids so public yeah. schools in a totality have failed Many people listening might say, well, what are you talking about? I just saw that 
episode of Little House in the Prairie isn't <laughs> like that. No. Or they might say to themselves, yeah, what happened to those PTA meetings? They don't exist, folks. When I was a kid in the 60s in square dancing in first grade, yeah. you know, and the parents were yelling, I want little Johnny to blah, blah, blah. Mr. Hayes, the principal. See, I haven't lost my facilities yet. I, yeah. I, know, I know all my teachers. Right? <laughs> so I'm not too old. So, so that, that doesn't exist. What exists are teachers' unions that are way too powerful, right? Sure, are some teachers underpaid or some overpaid? I don't want to get into that. Yeah. What I want to tell you is I think that a lot of them are underpaid. They, they could very well be. Of course, yeah. they have the summers off and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, whatever. But the, the parents need to get a check, and we need competition. And especially at the federal level, Let, let's if you if you're someone listening to this and you don't have kids, especially your property taxes wherever you live, the largest input is probably schools. But they're averaging twenty to twenty three thousand dollars a kid. I, I homeschooled my kids and put them in this and that for four thousand. Yeah, Catholic schools are doing it for eight. I mean, the the margins of getting a better education and cheaper, we can do that now. At the federal level, let's all ask, think about one thing. How do you know that the federal government couldn't care less? You think they do? Right now, there's something called the Internet. Came around the late 90s. Mm. And right now today, the best Algebra One teacher could be for free, free, on that federal website, doing videos, talking about Y equals MX plus B, what the slope is, boop, 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 boop. They could do all that for free. So when little Johnny or little Isabel missed this, got sick or had a pandemic, the moms could say, let's just watch this tonight. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. They don't have it up there. They're beholden yeah. to the National Teachers Union who would never allow it. A lot of this could be done for free. Now, am I trying to do away with school sports? I'm not. Listen. This is one of these things that will take years, but we oh, this is a this is a tough sell because a lot of people really love their public school system. I um, we, th there was a, a moment on the show. This was a, a few months ago, but it was kind of funny. Uh, Rob Azevedo, who hosts the show here, uh, he came in uh, early uh, for his show, and he he sat and we were talking, and my dad called, and my dad's very conservative. He'll 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 probably uh, <laughs> he'll he'll probably be very approving of of yeah, a, right. a lot of what you're saying, but um, he got into a uh, it was a pretty pretty big moment actually he got into a, a bit of an argument like a yelling argument with rob <laughs> because um you know my dad was talking about the failure of public schools and rob was saying that um his kids have had a great experience in public school and um and and i i believe that uh, you know they've they've done very well and they're going off to college and so forth and i i think that um part of the the problem you run into with this idea is I, I think that yes, there obviously there are schools, uh, school systems around the country that are are very uh, doing a very poor job, and and that is evidenced by when you contrast uh, our numbers of of uh, learning proficiency with uh, that of other countries, other modern industrialized nations. Yes, yeah, we're falling it's, behind it, every it's, year. It's it's pretty bad, um, but there are also school systems where where they do a great job, and and I'm not sure how you how you sell this to, to uh, parents in, in school districts who are doing well, a great listen, job. They don't have to. It, yeah. if, if somebody out there in some rural community says, we want to keep it and blah, 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 but just don't depend on the state for money. Mm. Why are you depending on the state for your kids? You can't. The more things we keep local and not federal or state, the better off we are. We have a call, and uh, my dad must have been listening because he's, <laughs> he's on the line. Hello. Hey, Maddie, I, I love your guest. Your guest is presenting such a I knew you great would. information. And uh, mm -hmm. I just, this is between us, but, and I'm, I'm going to be brief because I want to, uh, your guest to have the, uh, the opportunity to continue. And I know we're running out of time. I just got out of a meeting. But um, do you remember um, a debate I had with you a little bit, but more with a guest about the perils of, Public education. Do you remember that one? <laughs> well, I just, I just referenced it. I assumed that's why you were calling. Yeah, I, I was just telling Steve about that, uh, the uh, argument. Uh, and it, it did uh, become quite the argument yeah. that you had with Rob Azevedo on the show. Yes. Rob, I love and I love, I love Rob Azevedo, and I didn't yes. know that it was he. <laughs> I would have taken a different tack. But my point is that you've got books out there like uh, – your guest probably has read them or aware of them. Like um, I just mentioned too, "Waiting for Superman" is a great book by Tan. And then there's Golding's book, 
uh, which I love. It's called Savage Inequality, and it goes to the issues your guest is talking about. Public education in New Hampshire, we're doing reasonably well, but not nationwide uh, at all, and that's a disgrace. And it's, uh, you know, just parenthetically, and this is not to pin roses on me or to try to hurt anyone's feelings, but I grew up in a different world, and mm-hmm. all of my life experience, not perfect by any means, of course, but from grammar school to high school to college and graduate schools, I had great mentors and great opportunity for training and education, even in the military. You know, I was very, very fortunate. That was the grace of God in my judgment. I know we're not a religious program, so I'm not going to go too far with that. <laughs> but, but, uh, but we need to challenge the issue of public education, which has become more uh, indoctrination and propaganda. And these kids can't think. They, can't, they don't know how to problem solve. They don't know how to ask for help. Uh, they don't know their mathematics. You know, I still practice my algebra, not because I'm great at math, guys, <laughs> but because it's a challenge to help me think critically and logically. Mm-hmm. It's a discipline for me. I don't advise that necessarily for other people, but for me it works, oh, you know. I don't want to but, do that. But <laughs> um, this goes to elite capture, and there are two parts of elite capture. I just want to throw that out for your guests, too. Um, it's it's more an oblique reference, but it's important and it's related. It's germane. And that is that you have the elite capture A and B. A is easy to see. It's when a corporation or organization or teachers unions or um, Chinese communist governments, uh, even Romanian governments, apparently, we, we still need to know more, delineate that more fully uh, with Biden. But they try to influence pedal and they do you know they Mm -hmm. capture people's behavior and policies through big money but then there are i'm I'm not going to go into the mall but today because of time but there are four other aspects of uh persuasion and buying control and propaganda so i'll just mention one of them uh and that is the separation purposeful separation of families from the government particularly the federal government. But that includes school boards when, when people are, are, are not included and people don't get involved, you know, two sides of a, of a, same, a similar coin there. And, and as a result of that, secrets are kept, um, issues of personal values are kept, and education is undermined. So that's elite capture. That's a structure that's not only problematic, but it is pernicious. And and you see this with that 13% your guest just mentioned. I'm so appalled by that and discouraged by that, but I'm not surprised at all. And the 20%, we need to do so much better. You know, some of these kids, when I was in eighth grade, and again, it's not me, but my other students too, we had teachers that taught these things. We were interested. Our parents reinforced that and demanded that and had a discipline with that. We knew who the senators were. We knew how many how many states were in the union. Uh, we knew the three branches of government, and we could talk mm. about it. We know who wrote the Constitution and why it was important. Uh, these kids don't know today. So um, I'm a little bit vindicated on that issue. But there are many things we could do, I believe, to improve the situation. But we have to have the will and the value system to do that. Finally, I just wanted to say, uh, God bless Jenny. We don't always agree on some major issues. <laughs> and I don't call to debate her or you or anything like that. Yeah. But uh, I am with you guys 100%. Uh, I never thought I'd be with Bernie Sanders on anything, frankly. Yeah. But we need to have a, a, a system in this country where everyone gets medical care. Uh, these insurance companies have abused it. I've been slow to come to this conclusion, but I'm there now with you guys. So kudos to you. I'll stop there, guys. Great show, Matt. <laughs> I love the way you take a balanced position on these issues. Thank That's you. That's very sophisticated. I'm very proud of you. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. I assume you were talking to me, or did you mean Steve? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and, and, and actually, actually, I was talking to you. You're my son, Maddie, <laughs> and I think Steve is a distant relative. I think I may be a great uncle or something. <laughs> I hope so. so. You sound kudos like a lot to of, you, Steve. A lot of common sense. <laughs> I know the work you're doing. Well, we're gonna we're gonna get this across to America, and your dad's a you, very wise man. I mean, one, you learn over time, and the bottom yes. line for education is simply this: with these kind of yes. test scores oh, that yeah. keep going lower, what does everybody else want to yeah. do? 
the, now, the same yeah, thing? I mean, absolutely. we have Republican governors who want to take the wokeness out of schools. God, God bless them. That'll, six, that'll yeah. fix 3% of the problem. The hmm. problem is right now, your dad talking, is that there's a guy like your dad. I don't know what he did. But there's a kid named Steve Lampy. He's sitting in Detroit right now. He's sitting in Memphis. He's yep. sitting somewhere in Manchester. And he's either really smart and get ahead, but no one's letting him get ahead. Mm. By the yeah. way, the three yeah. kids I homeschooled because of the cancer in my family, one of them is the youngest at Midia Karas State University in the history of the university at the age of 12. Oh, wow. So he wow. wasn't held back. That's the other fantastic. one, by the way, was only two years older. She yeah. just, you know. Wow. So yeah. there, there are three yeah, of them absolutely. sophomores. So listen, we, we, can, we have to change this thing radically. We can't wake up. We're going to wake up next year, and I'm going to be on the show. And you, I'm going to tell you about the, the new math scores that are lower. Hmm. And someone's going to yeah, call in and yeah. say, oh, we can't do that. Our schools are pretty good. We'll keep them. But I want to check for every mom and dad <laughs> so yeah. they can make the choice. And here's the math that the unions always do. Oh, you're going to take our best students. Do the math, folks. If it's yeah. $7,000 a kid out of 100 kids in one school and 90 right. leave and there's 10 left, heck, you can give yeah. them all 40 yeah. grand. And save money Absolutely. for taxpayers and get better yeah. education for all. We're, we're, uh, so for before, all. D yeah. Dad, Dad, we got to let you go in a second. Just a quick question, though, before you go. Uh, are you yeah. are you prepared now publicly to uh, dump Trump and uh, endorse uh, Steve Laffey? <laughs> I just want to hear you say it. Yeah. Yes, I am. Yes. Yay! <laughs> all right. Go. One at a time. We Steve, just keep moving. Steve, send me some material. Yeah. You know, i got to say just parenthetically quickly, I do like uh, Vivek Ramaswamy. Have you guys listened to him at all? I have. Yeah. Yes, I, I not to think? get into it, but he's a very smart guy, but lots of stuff he comes up with doesn't solve the problem, like having the Fed look at commodities. Yeah. But we're but, not going to look at commodities. Yeah, right, we're going to keep right. it at zero. But the important, <laughs> but the important thing is, uh, Dad, yeah. you, you have you have said uh, you are willing to dump Trump. And uh, okay, well, we got to go. A purpose for me being here. <laughs> that's, right, that's right. That's right. All right. I'm only you, one person, Maddie. Come on. I know. It's a, all right, Dad. Well, we, we we do have to go though. But thank you yeah. for the call. I appreciate it. My pleasure and honor. Thank you for your guest wonderful presentation. Uh, Peace. All right. Love, I love you. you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, that was my dad, uh, Martin Connerton. Uh, I do want to get this in, Steve, uh, just <laughs> yeah. quickly, because uh, a few people brought it up in the chat room. A sure. concern about, um, in terms of education, kids with disabilities, yeah. if, if we go to a, a primarily a homeschool model. Yeah, um, they're prob they're, listen, in that, kind of, in that kind of model, we're going to have to, and, and uh, listen, as an 18-year-old kid, my, I was president of student council, Cranston East. Yeah. Joe Venatulo walks in, we're integrating special needs students. We had different names for it back then. And he's like, you know what? You're the president of student council. No one makes fun of these kids. Mm. Down syndrome and so forth. Yeah, yeah. So, by the way, we had a great year. We did. And I got all the clicks together, the gre what we would call greasers and, you know, hockey players. And we just made sure we had a great year. Kids were doing stuff. Yeah. But yeah. Listen, in the end, we're always going to be left with people that really, really need our help. And we'll get to spend the money to help them. Yeah. And that's going to be a special situation. But, but here's the problem with what the federal government does. They go like this with the PPP program. My arms are as wide as I can. Instead of saying, you know what, with a rifle, what do we really need to do? A figurative rifle. Yeah, what yeah. do we need to do to help? So we're always going to help the special needs kids, the kids who have Down syndrome. We're going to put. We're not going to put them away so we don't see them. They're going to be out in front, and we'll have extra money to spend on them so they have the fullest life. And by the way, I grew up with families that had these situations. Mm. Now, I had different situations. I had schizophrenia in my family. I had a lot of different things going on in my family, right? Yeah. Um, my, my, my brother tried to burn down the Institute of Mental Health in Cranston, Rhode Island, while I was the mayor. Wow. He got locked up in a psychiatric ward for criminally insane oh for my many, many years. Wow. So I know this stuff, yeah, right? Yeah. It's not like I'm trying to ignore it, but when it comes to that kind of stuff, we are. But let's have the extra money to target on special needs not wasting it left and right. And by the way, these eighth grade kids should be deciding like they do in Germany in many respects. Hey, you know what? I don't want to do algebra two. I'm going to fix cars. Why not? Right. What we do is we, we keep taking the square peg and we kind of keep jamming these round holes, right? The square peg is can't go into these round holes. Let's find a better situation for the kids. Um, 
I, we're yeah, we are about out of time. I feel like we just barely scratched the <laughs> the, the, the surface. So we'll if, if uh, we'll have to have you on again soon. Are, are you in New Hampshire yes, a lot? I'm, I, these by days? the way, I'm Steve Laffey. I'm in New Hampshire. I've been here since off and on since February 25th. Yeah. Um, I don't have any intention of leaving. We're going to make it on the ballot, and we're going to make our we're going to make our breakthrough the way Herman Cain did in Florida in 2011, who became a friend of mine, which is why I have the 999 tax plan at stevelaffey.com. And um, because we need a simple system that people can understand, and it works, and we collect a lot more money. But I'm going to be in New Hampshire. I'm here. I'm just here. Yeah, I'd love to have a, a let's a, do it again. I'd love to have an in-depth conversation with you about healthcare. Um, you know, Jenny is. Uh, you know, as as my dad referred to, and as I mentioned earlier in the show, Jenny is in Washington D.C. right now. Um, we probably disagree on that, but you know, we we support uh, she and I and my dad too at this point uh, support uh, socialized medicine. But I know you have a lot of of ideas about healthcare, mm-hmm. um, so I'd love to talk to you about yeah. that and, and renewable energy and some other things. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll do this again. Uh, we'll do this again soon. And um, and you got my dad to say that uh, he'll dump uh, dump Trump. Uh, so that's that's good. I'm not a. I don't know how you feel about. I'm not a fan. Uh, no, I'm. I'm listen, <laughs> well, you're running against him. So. I am running against him, and I, and I think I think a lot of it is is marketing. And listen, as a conservative, there were some good things that happened. If you're a conservative person like myself, but it's but running. But listen to everybody listening who hasn't yet dumped Trump, President Trump. I try to be respectful. Mm-hmm. We, if you're listening and you're conservative, we were totally against. Barack Obama's $8 trillion deficits over eight years. And many of, not me, I was always against him, never voted for Donald Trump. We were okay with $8 trillion of deficits in four years. And now we're not okay with Biden's less than that in four years, but we're not okay with any of it. We want to shut down the government, stop the bets. We, we have no credibility. Republicans, listen, let's get back to the basics. And that means stuff I'm talking about, real solutions, and acknowledge that some people won't like it. Well, I always say Republicans only care about the the debt and deficits yeah. when when there's a Democrat in office. You got it. <laughs> and I care about it every day because I am no, I have no debt. I don't have any debt. I w- I always run surpluses. Yeah. I know you got to end the show, but yeah, we it's SteveLaffey.com. Go. By the way, I'm the only website with this hundreds of hours of stuff. You want to hear about me and Ariel Sharon? I got an hour on that. <laughs> I don't know why anybody would, but I, but, but I didn't take anything down. What I've said for yeah. a long time, I, I I still say it. Well, uh, all right. Well, yeah, so we will uh, we will have you back, and uh, thank you for coming in. Uh, wonderful to meet you. I actually you have a, yeah. I actually have a, a song I'm going to close. I picked a special song for you. Uh, this is a little weird, but there was a hip-hop group called D4L, and they had a song called Laffy Taffy. Well, I, oh. And I was reading about you online. Right. And I saw that when you were running for mayor, mm-hmm. uh, you, you gave out uh, Laffy Taffy at a campaign event. At a campaign event? I bought a crate of it. Did you? Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, I, it's too long to tell you. I, yeah, yeah. But, but Laffy next, Taffy, next time, yes, yeah. became so, let's just put it this way, in Cranston, walking behind some kids with my kids, and so one kid in front says, hey, what's with this Laffy Taffy this year? Why? That was the year I won the election. <laughs> there you go. That might have been around when this song came out, actually. It's a terrible song, but that, I just I, th- I thought I thought it was funny. So yeah, let's we'll, go with we'll, it. We'll, we'll we'll end with this. But uh, thank you, uh, thank you again, Steve. Thank you very much for having me. Let's a- do it. Absolutely, Republican uh, candidate for the presidency, Steve Laffey. And uh, thank you again uh, to uh, Yuri from uh, uh, from the band. Uh, I want to make sure I get the name right this time. Uh, from the band Oberon, who uh, skyped in all the way from Italy during the first hour. Uh, if you missed any part of today's show, it'll be up in just a little bit at WMNHradio.org and at my website, mattconnerton.com. And uh, tomorrow is Wednesday, uh, which means uh, in the first hour we'll be joined by uh, Eric Pilcher uh, as uh, he's uh, doing a new segment with us on Wednesdays where we talk about uh, media. And then in the second hour, uh, we have a musical guest, uh, Horsefly Gulch, uh, will be joining us. And they are coming in live in studio Uh, So that's going to do it for us for now. Oh, and if you're listening live on Tuesday, coming up next immediately after this show is Through the Stage Door, hosted by Rob Dion. And then at 7 p.m., a replay of Friday night's Retro Spectrum Radio with Pauly C. And uh, Steve Laffey, thank you again. And uh, here's a little bit of uh, Laffy Taffy for you. (laughs) 